Good morning. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open to Hebrews chapter 6. We've been working through a series on discipleship, and as part of that series, we've been looking at the, what Scripture calls the elementary doctrines of our faith. Now, keeping in mind that this list that's given in Hebrews is, is not an, inclu an all-inclusive list. There are other doctrines that are considered elementary to our faith, but this is a good place to start. Okay? Um, so in order to understand where we're at in chapter 6, we've got to back up into 5. Read with me if you would. I'm going to pick up in verse 11 of chapter 5. We're going to read through verse 3 of chapter 6. So the, the author says, About this we have much to say, and it is hard to explain, since you become dull of hearing. Pay attention to that. Notice that it's not the subject that's difficult. It's their learning. It's their, their hearing that's the problem. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish <clears throat> good from evil. Therefore, because everything that we've just read, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God and of instruction about washings, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. So, we have worked through the first five topics. We've, we've already taken a look at um, repentance from dead works. We've looked at uh, faith toward God. Instruction about washings, or in some of your translations it might say baptism. Um, the laying on of hands. The resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. Now, eternal judgment and the resurrection of the dead go fist in glove. Okay, they, 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 they go together. They're, they're blended. You can't really look at one without taking into consideration the other. Okay, because if you look at just the resurrection of the dead, what are we resurrected to? There's something that has to come next. And if you're looking at just the, the judgment, then what about all those that have passed on before? Okay, so both of these things occur. Uh, last week we talked a bit about eternal judgment, and we need to kind of understand that eternal judgment, it's not that you are judged for eternity, but where you will spend eternity because of the judgment. All right? And this is something that is rooted way back in Genesis chapter 3 with the fall of man. When sin came in, up to that point, all judgment was rendered unnecessary because there was no sin. So there was no lawbreakers. There, there was no need for a law because there was nothing that told man that he was off because he wasn't off. Okay? Well, he takes the fruit, she gives it to the man, they both eat, sin comes in. Separation of God. They, they, they're, they're removed out of that intimacy. Now we know that they still had some sort of relationship with God, but something was broken. And they were cast out of the garden. So, you know, if you look at the first few chapters of Genesis and you look at the last couple chapters of Revelation, you get the whole story in a nutshell. So we've seen sin come in. We've seen, I mean, all you got to do is turn on the TV and you will see the byproduct. You'll see the work of sin active in the world. Okay? It's everywhere. Uh, and it doesn't matter what you watch. 
I don't care what you watch. You watch the news. You're going to see what man does to each other. You, you watch a movie. I guarantee you, you're going to see sin in the movie. You watch PBS. You will find sin knitted in and woven throughout whatever you're watching. That's why it's so important for us to become discerners of good and evil. Okay? So, sin has come in. It's, it's an act of the separation from God. We know that in Genesis chapter 3, with the coming in of sin, with the coming in of death, God also brought a promise, did He? Because He prophesied that there would be one, a seed, not seeds, born of woman, who would crush the serpent's head. But He also said that serpent was going to bruise His heel. Okay? So we see that, that judgment has been enacted right there with the first sin. Because what happened? A curse came on them, didn't it? I mean, the, there were things that came as a direct result of sin. They are cast out of the garden. Man will labor and toil. Women will have increased pain in childbirth. And the snake slithers on its belly. I don't know which is more terrifying, honestly. I don't like snakes. The Van Notes have a phobia about snakes. I don't like them. Do not ever present to me a snake. I will become unholy in an instant. Okay? And it will be your fault. Okay? But I don't know which terrifies me more. A snake that, you know, you walk out in the backyard and a snake goes slithering across the lawn. You know, Mike... Kidder was out a couple of years ago, and we were walking out to the back field. We were going to do some weed eating, and, and we got about six feet from where we wanted to weed eat. And I stopped. Mike, what is that? It looks like a snake. I went no further. Mike walked up with the weed eater, and he got to about three feet from it. And when he realized what it was, guess what two grown men were doing? <laughs> Time for tea. But we went back in the house, and, and Cindy is standing up on the deck laughing her head off. She's just laughing at us, okay? But I don't know what terrifies me more. A snake slithering in the grass, or one that walks up to me and talks to me. That would really freak me out, okay? So sin comes in, there's this judgment, um, they're kicked out, but that's not the end of the story. Thank God it's not the end of the story. Because see, even before God created it all, He had in plan, He knew that we would need a Redeemer. That there was going to be a price that needed to be exacted to meet the just requirement of the law, of God. Okay? So, before the foundation of the world, the Lamb was slain. So the plan to redeem us was already in effect before Adam ever sinned. That should give you great hope. Okay? That should bring you peace. Because God knows what He's doing. Alright? So, we see going through, uh, we see judgment come at the time of Noah. God floods the entire earth. Um, the vast majority of mankind dies. The vast majority of creation is destroyed. And then God makes a promise. Never again will I destroy the earth. With a flood. By flood. By water. Okay? Notice he didn't say anything about fire. Okay? So, judgment. Then, then Adam or uh, Noah and, and his wife and their kids. And, and what's the first thing they do? Adam gets drunk. Great. Just great. Now, we can all trace our roots back to Noah. We're going to, I'm going to plant a garden. I'm going to drink the produce. And then I'm going to pass out drunk. All right? Uh, interesting, just a little sidebar here. If you ever get the opportunity, take a look at the descendants of the three sons and take a look at the, their course over history and you will see the curse that God enacted on, on the sons and the blessing that He enacted on the sons because of how they treated their father. It's an interesting study. Back to on topic here. Okay, time goes on. God chooses for Himself a person from whom he will make a great nation, that nation being Israel, 
Why? Why did God choose a nation? Why did God choose any nation? Because through them, he would touch the world. They would become the lighthouse, the beacon, if you will, for the rest of the world to be drawn to God. It's very interesting in the way God set this whole thing up because when he laid out the law, when he gave to Moses what he wanted his people to be like and what he wanted them to do, he was very careful in there to talk about the foreigner amongst them and how they were to treat with the foreigner amongst them because the whole plan, even to where he put them, was designed for them to be able to reach out into the world. Okay? Israel sits at the crossroads between Africa, Europe, and Asia. They are strategically positioned so that any commerce, anything going on between these three continents comes through them. Okay? So, God establishes the law. Why was the law given? To make us aware of sin. So that we would understand that we need help. Okay? Hebrews tells us, man, if, if the sacrifice of a lamb was enough, it would be one and done. But because the, the covering of the blood of the lamb and the goat was not sufficient, it had to be done year after year, time and time again. All right? This is judgment. This is where you come in and you recognize that before God you have violated His holy principles and you're subject to His judgment. The first thing you've got to understand about His judgment is that God's in a place to judge. If you don't accept that God is in a place to judge you, it doesn't really change the outcome but it puts you in a bad spot. It puts you in a very bad spot because if you don't accept that the almighty creator of heaven and earth and everything that lives and dwells in it, you're not going to look to be redeemed. You're not going to look for salvation. You don't think you need it. You think you're okay. We talked last week about the final judgment. Okay? Before we get to the final judgment, there's one other significant event, actually the ultimate significant event that happens. The law has come. Israel is made aware of their sin. They're, they see that they cannot do it on their own over and over and over and over again. Even under the great and mighty king of David, the man after God's own heart, sin works its way in, doesn't it? Because we know David sinned. He sinned with Bathsheba. That's the first one. He sinned with Uriah. That's the second one. He sinned with the, the census. Another one. Each of those incurring a judgment. Okay? So the law comes in. Now, Israel, and by extension the world, is without excuse. Okay? How do we get out of the mess? Through the blood of the cross. Because Hebrews also says that once and for all the sacrifice is done. Never needing be done again. It was the perfect sacrifice. Okay? We talked last week a little bit about the judgment. We, we talked about who our judge is. We know that the judge is ultimately God, but we also know that he is appointed specifically the judge, to be his son, Jesus Christ. Which I think is amazing, because the son is the one that came and lived as we live, subject to all of our weaknesses, and yet did not sin. Okay? We, we looked at some of the attributes of our judge. Let's, let's take a look real quick. I'm just going to go over the list that we went over last week. Uh, first, he's perfect. He is without flaw. Being God, He is omniscient. He knows everything perfectly. He knows why you do things better than you know why you do things. There are so many times Christy will ask me, why did you do that? I really don't know. Why, why would you do that? Do you, I mean, do you ever stop and examine why you do what you do? 
why things are the way that they are, the, 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 the manner in which you do them. God understands all of that. <coughs> and we can get back to the root of it. So one, he's perfect. Two, he has no sin. If he had sin, his sacrifice would not have been perfect and pure. And we would need another sacrifice. He is impartial. And he cannot be swayed. You cannot bribe your way out of judgment. He is absolutely impartial. Everybody will be judged. Everybody. I'm going to get to that in a minute, so don't freak out. Because I know some of you are going, wait a minute. We are all going to be judged, but let me explain. Uh, before we get there, um, first, the idea of judgment is actually rooted in the Hebrew Bible. You'll see uh, throughout the Old Testament scriptures, you will see the phrase, the day of the Lord. Now, what's interesting about this is in the Hebrew Bible, they only had a partial understanding of what was coming. They only had a, a, a partial because they knew the great and terrible day of the Lord was coming. And, and in the New Testament, we still have the same thing, but we see it through the lens of grace. Thank God for that. Because without His grace, we are subject to that great and terrible day of the Lord. Without that blood being poured over us, without that redemption, without our price being paid, we would stand before Him on that great and terrible day. Uh, a couple of things about that great and terrible day. Um, says that it will be a day of wrath. It will be a day of distress, a day of anguish, a day of ruin and devastation, darkness and gloom. Doesn't sound like a good day. Actually, it kind of reminds me of what we had back in August. <laughs> a little bit. It will be worse than that. But one of the things that is lacking, you know, now historically, and actually in, in Christian circles today, a lot of people look at these judgments, the, the, the day of the Lord, and they look back and they point and they say, well, that was when, when Jerusalem fell to the Babylonians. You can see judgment there, absolutely. God said, this is what's going to happen. You didn't follow my holy decrees, and this is the result of that. Some people say, you know, in the intertestamental period with, with the Greeks coming in and then uh, Alexander dying and the uh, Ptolemies and the, the Seleucids getting warring with each other and Antiochus IV coming in and, and, and doing a, a sacrifice of a pig in the, the, the temple of the Lord. And they say, you know, that, that was a time. Other people say, well, no, in 70 AD when Rome came in and, and sacked Jerusalem for the second time. All of those we see God's judgment. But we don't see the day of the Lord. Because there's one significant difference. And this is why I disagree with those that say this has already taken place. Because I want to read to you two passages. Uh, Joel chapter 3 verse 2. Go ahead and turn there if you would. Joel chapter 3. There's two passages in Joel that I want to read. Okay, so Joel chapter 3. I'm going to start in verse 1. He says, For behold, in those days and at that time, when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem. First, I, I want to pause there for just a minute. Okay? Because this is happening today. 1948. When the world decided that Israel, the Jews needed a home and they put them back in Israel, that was a direct fulfillment of what God said was going to happen in here. Everything that is happening over there in Israel, if you put on the lens of Scripture and prophecy, you will see that things are moving according to the definite timeline and plan of what God has. Okay? So... When I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem, we see they're back in Israel. 
we see that Israel, the land, has flourished under them. Uh, I, I had the opportunity in some of my studies, I saw a picture of, um, oh, come on, Tom Sawyer, Mark Twain. Huck, Huck Finn didn't make it that far. Mark Twain, Samuel Clemens, actually went over to Canaan, and there's a photograph of him standing there. And I'm, I'm saying Canaan because the Jews were not here yet. And it is a barren wasteland. It looks like he's standing in the middle of the Sahara. Somebody went back to fairly close to that same spot and took a picture. And you can recognize the outline, the hills in the background, and, and where things were generally. But it's green. And there's groves. And there's life. God promised that when he brought his people back into the land, the land would flourish. We had the opportunity when we were in Israel, um, that when they brought us to Jerusalem, we were up on Mount Scopus. Uh, so that if you're looking at the Jerusalem, you're on the east side, just a little bit north of where the, the Temple Mount is. Okay, So you're looking southwest to the Temple. And they, they laid out this fruit I don't even know what to call it. Awesomeness. <laughs> they had three fruit trays that were there. And I have never in my life tasted such fruit. I, I was picking up stuff I didn't know what it was. I may have, made, I may have eaten decorations. <laughs> I don't know. Because it all looked so incredible. Uh, I, when we first walked up, I looked and there was pineapple. I love pineapple. And I looked and it was white. And I thought, oh, that usually is a bad sign. That's usually not a good thing. But, you know, I'm going to try some of everything. And I picked it up and, oh my gosh, I have never tasted pineapple that sweet. I had never eaten star fruit. I wasn't sure you were supposed to eat them. I see them in the grocery store occasionally. And I look at things like that and I go, who decided to put that in their mouth? <laughs> okay. And, but this was all cut up and sliced, so I didn't really recognize it. I picked it up and I, I you would have thought you were eating candy. It was incredible. That's a fulfillment of what God said would happen when he brought his people back into the land he promised them. Stuff grows there. And driving down the Dead Sea, you're looking at this wilderness. There is nothing there. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, oh yeah, here's a grove of banana trees. Oh yeah, here's some fig trees. And it's just blooming. Look, I can't get that to grow in my yard. And it's just blooming there. Okay, so this is happening today. Okay, but it's not all of what's happening today because of verse 2. I will gather all the nations and bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat. And I will enter into judgment with them there on behalf of my people and my heritage Israel because they have scattered them among the nations and have divided up my land. Nowhere in our history do we see this occurring. Okay? But there's a couple things here you have to catch. Okay? The first is, God will be there to pass judgment. Okay? God will be there to pass judgment. Two, I don't know how it's going to work. God is, is beyond our physics. But he says he will gather the nations there and he will pass judgment. Okay? Keep in mind that these nations were subject to his will to accomplish his purposes, but that does not exonerate them. That does not make them guiltless. Okay? Whatever your excuse in your sin, it separates you from God. And you are judged accordingly. Okay? So let's jump down a little bit further. Um, verse 12 let the nations stir themselves up and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat and there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations now for those of you that don't know the, the valley of Jehoshaphat is the Kidron Valley it is the east side of Jerusalem it's what separates Jerusalem uh, the Temple Mount from the Mount of Olives. It's that valley that runs down there. It's actually the, the, the stroke of the letter Shin. If you look at Jerusalem, God says, 
that he has chosen that place to be his capital, to be his place where he will commune with man, and he has put his name on it. You look on Google Earth and you look at the map of Jerusalem, you'll notice that there's three valleys, okay? There's Gehenna on the west side, and it kind of curls around on the south, and it meets up with the, the valley in the middle, which is called the Tyropian Valley, and then those curl around together, and they meet up with the Kidron Valley. That letter is the letter Shin, which in Hebrew is the letter used to represent God. So he has literally, with his finger, put his name on Jerusalem. That's mine. Okay? Um, when our kids were little, um, we eat cereal. We eat lots of cereal. My kids would eat my cereal. And so we would buy two boxes so I could have cereal. They would eat both boxes. <laughs> and so we got to the point where we put dad on a box. You did not touch dad's box of cereal without talking to dad first. And even before the kids knew how to read, they knew that block mark was a bad thing. <laughs> Don't touch. God's saying the same thing. This is mine. Don't touch. Okay? So, why I believe <clears throat> that the judgment was not <clears throat> when the Babylonians threw down Jerusalem, not when the Romans threw down Jerusalem, is because the nations have yet to be gathered before him to be judged. Okay, so two judgments. We talked about two judgments. The first, I pray God that everyone in this room is subject to the first. Okay, Scripture tells us that we will be called before the judgment seat of Christ. Okay, every man will give an account. All right, but we as believers are not called to judgment to determine our future. Because we stand under the blood of the cross. We stand righteous and holy with a righteousness not our own. We stand righteous with the very righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We stand before Him and He looks at us. He does not see our sin. It has been removed from us as far as the east is the east is from the west. Okay? So it's of no more. It's no longer taken into account. So that judgment is not a judgment based on the law and the justice of God because the justice of God in this case has been met. The price that was required in this case has been paid. And that's what Jesus meant when he said, it is finished. It is accomplished. It is paid. Okay? So, when the believers are judged, it's not unto eternity, but it's unto what? Works. works. But, but the works are unto rewards. rewards. Okay? When we stand before him, we're going to be just like those, those three servants when the master went out of town and he gave into their care certain amounts of monies. Okay? In, in some it was ten and five and one, and, and in another it was three and two and one. That's irrelevant. The amount doesn't matter. Because as long as the servants were working on behalf of the master and he came back and they were able to give account as to what they had done with what he had given them, they all received the same reward. Enter into your master's rest. Enter into your master's rest. But the rewards are significant and they're important because God says so. If God says it's important, we should pay attention. This should be something that we strive for, that we desire, that we want in our lives. Because on that day, everything that we have done is put through the fire. Not to kill you, not to destroy you, but to test the value of all that you have done. And when you come out on the other side, all the impurity, all the, the false motives, whatever is gone. And God looks at you and He sees righteousness. He saw righteousness beforehand. 
because it's based on Christ's action, okay? He saw the righteousness beforehand, but now he's looking at you and he is rewarding you for all that you have done on his behalf. This goes back to that first elementary doctrine, doctrine repentance from dead works. Okay? These are not, they should not be dead works. Colossians says, whatever we do in word or in deed, we should do it in the name of the Lord. We do it unto Him. Doesn't matter how you think about the task. It matters how you act about the task. You may work for a jerk. Your boss may be Man, you can't wait for him to get in front of the judgment seat. But God says, you work not as unto him, but as unto me. That's where we set and devote our time. Not because our, our boss is necessarily worthy, but because Christ is worthy, because God is worthy. And we know ultimately that's who we're working for in everything we do in our life. So the first judgment, the judgment of the believers, and this is only for believers, we stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. I want to read this to you. It says that, For we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Okay? The evil stuff, that's the stuff that's going to get burned up. Alright? Now what's, what's interesting here, the word judge here is a Greek word, bima. Doesn't that excite you? <laughs> you guys should be excited. The Greek word is bima. Come on! You gotta be excited. Oh, it would help if you knew what bima meant, wouldn't it? See, Bema is not a judgment where the judge sits and he determines a case as to right or wrong. Bema is a word specifically used for the judge of the Olympic Games. And that judgment was giving the rewards. Well done, first place. You ran a good race. Here's your reward. As a matter of fact, Scripture, Paul uses this illustration when he says, we do not have an imperishable crown, right? Right? He's, he's using a, a phraseology that the, the Greeks would understand because they understood that when you ran the, when you won, you got a crown. But it was the, the crown of laurel leaves and, and that would die. And, and then next year you'd have to go back and run the race again. Okay? So the, the crown that we get is imperishable. Bema is not a judgment as to whether you're in or whether you're out. Bema is God looking at you and giving you rewards for what you've done. Okay? What value are those rewards going to have when you're living in a city with streets paved with pure gold? Oh, look at my ruby. Yeah, dude, I got one of those for a doorknob. Yeah, yeah the whole foundation is laid on that. Okay? That, that's not going to be something that we're going to be going, Oh, look at me! Yay! Look at my 50 cents! Or, look at my 50 billion. That's irrelevant. The significance of this, and, and we looked at the scripture last week in Revelation, uh, talks about the 24 elders. When the, the creatures worship God, they will fall down, they will throw their crowns down. Okay? I believe the 24 is a significant number. I believe it's because it represents the 12 tribes of Israel. Okay? The, the, the 12 tribes. I believe it also, that's, that's the first half. The second half is the 12 apostles. And I think that that is significant because it, it is a fulfillment of what God said he would do to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. I think that number 24 represents all who believe. Everybody. Okay? There are other opinions out there. That's fine. This is just an opinion. This is just what I think. One of these days we'll stand before God and you can go, Ha! Ah, you were wrong! Or, Whoa, you were right. We'll all find out together. Okay? So, but, but I believe that's a symbolism because the natural reaction of all who are in heaven is going to be when God is worshipped to fall down and worship. Completely uninhibited. Okay? W without shame, without remorse. With, I mean just pure. Pure worship. 
So, Bema, when you read uh, this passage, Bema, based on your awards, not based on whether you're in or whether you're out. Okay? We talked last week about the five crowns. I'm just going to touch them real quick. Did anybody find another crown? I only found five. And then when I was doing my studies this week, I found out that's actually a thing. Other people have found five. So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of behind the ball. I'm, I'm behind the game here. I, I found five crowns uh, that Scripture talks about. We, we see the crown uh, incorruptible, 1 Corinthians 9.25. The crown of rejoicing, 1 Thessalonians 2, 19 and 20. The crown of righteousness, 2 Timothy 4.8. The crown of life, James 1.2, Revelation 2.10. And the crown of glory, 1 Peter 5, 4. Okay? These are the crowns that we will receive. I don't know, you know, I mean, is there a group that gets one crown and another gets another? Or do some people get multiple crowns? And I, I you know, God didn't entrust that to me. And, and to be honest with you, we don't need to know that. We don't really need to know what we're getting. We just need to know we're getting. Because that's what he said. Okay? So, our judgment is based on what we've done, not dead works, but unto Christ on behalf of God. But then there's the other judgment. And this is where things get ugly because, see, this is the judgment that man earned at the fall. And every single man or woman born since then has earned apart from the redemption of the cross. Okay? Turn with me in your Bibles. We're going to take a look in Revelation Chapter 20, I'm going to read the passage to you. We'll speak for just a moment on this. <clears throat> We're going to start in verse 1. This is the, the picture, the image that was given to John. Okay, This is what the Spirit told him not to seal up. He, he wanted this given so that we would have it, so that we would have insight and understanding. One of the things that we have to do as a believer, and if you're not, you really need to get on board with this. When you read the Bible, you need to pray for understanding. Because God said that the Spirit will give us understanding. Okay? I can only do so much. I'm limited. I make mistakes. I got a tiny brain. <clears throat> but God's Spirit knows all things. And if you go to God's Spirit, He is faithful and true. He will reveal to you what you need to know. All right? So, not to disqualify study, because we're also called to be like the Bereans who went and checked the Scriptures. All right? So there's a place for both of those. The, the, the best place is to have the Spirit of God revealing to you as you study. All right? So, verse 1. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. <clears throat> you guys know why he put devil and Satan in there? They're, they're two names for the same character. They're actually descriptors. They're describing him. Because one is the deceiver and the other is the accuser. Okay, so... so all of this is who Satan is. We, we have the name Satan, but really what we're calling him is an accuser or a, a deceiver. Okay? So he uses both of those so you understand that all of this, that one, led us astray, and two, caused us to stand before God corrupted, is a result of this. Alright? So that's why that's in there twice. And bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him. So that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that, he might be released for a little while. Um, <clears throat> then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. Also I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image, and had not received its mark on their forehead. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. 
Okay, so here's the setup. Okay, see that these here that they they resurrected and there's that they're not under the judgment. Now let's jump down because we've already discussed this. We, and and no, we're not getting into the millennial reign. We're not going to go into that now. That's something that requires a great depth of explanation. We don't have time for today. Eventually, God willing, we'll get to this and we'll start taking this apart as we get to looking at the eschatology, okay, the, the study of the end times. So jumping down to verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. Now just real quick, uh, do, do you guys know why there's a difference between this judgment having one throne and the other having multiple thrones? Well, Scripture tells us that don't you know that we will judge the angels? And, and that judgment is given to us, that's this judgment. The, the final judgment here, this is for Christ alone. Okay, this is just for Him. Alright? And Him who was seated on it, from His presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Okay? Now, what we believe in these books, the plural is all the acts every person ever committed. And not just the deeds done physically, but what they contemplated in their brain, what was in their soul. Because Jesus said, you know, sin isn't when you actually do the act. Sin is when you conceive it in your heart. Okay, if, if it's not enough to murder your brother, but if you hate him, you've already committed it. It's not enough to commit adultery, but if you've looked lustfully, you've already committed it. So, so I believe these books, and that's why there's books plural, because it's going to be a lot of them. It's opened up. But then, look down halfway through verse 12, then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Now if we stop right there, it looks like there is a judgment based on works, doesn't it? Well, everybody's judged. And if your good works outweigh your bad works, then you're not in a bad spot and, and you're okay. But, but see, that's not where it stops, is it? And this is where it's so troublesome because the devil has convinced so many people, if you're a good enough person, you're okay. If your good outweighs your bad, you'll be fine. Okay? Okay? without consideration to these next verses. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. Okay, so you see uh, the, the, the judgment that took place to the believers is unto rewards. Our eternity is in the new heaven, the new earth. This is the result of the second judgment. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Now, I don't know as part of God's judgment. I mean, we, we understand from other passages that each will be rewarded according to what he has done. I don't know if God's going to be given, you know, those unbelievers. That he's going to give them wealth and riches and they're going to be hooping and hollering thinking they're going to live it up. But what good is that going to do them? when they are cast into the lake of fire for eternity. <coughs> How much are you going to enjoy anything down there? We, we can't even fathom a place like this. It's called the lake of fire. In other places, it's called the outer darkness. The only thing that we know for sure as to what's going to be happening there is its eternal separation from our Creator. See, even those who have rejected Christ their entire life long live in a world that the Holy Spirit is present, that God is active. So they don't fathom, we can't really even fathom an eternity separated from that. We, we, we can't even register in our brains how absolutely devastating that's going to be. See, this is the second judgment. The first type, the first judgment type is unto rewards. It's based on the fact that you have received the blood of Christ. You have accepted Him as Lord and Savior. You have exhibited a life-changing faith in your life. Okay? You've received His grace. And then everything from that point on is being judged to reward you. 
the rewards are significant because it's what you're going to turn around and give back to him. I don't want to get up there and have nothing to give him. Okay? I want to give him a lot. The second judgment is not unto, it's not like the first judgment. This one, it doesn't matter. You could be the greatest person on the face of the earth but without the blood of Christ, without your name being written in the Lamb's book of life. Your eternity is set into a place that our brains can't even wrap themselves around as to the horror of it. Eternal judgment. See, if you just left at judgment, we could talk about, oh, well, maybe there's going to come a point when God will give them a second chance or, or, or things like that, but that's not what the Word says. He says once we get to that place, whether we are judged unto reward or judged unto hell, it's eternal. It's forever. That's it. No getting out, no going back. I don't understand how that's going to work. We're stuck in a, a life of time. We, we move almost to the second, don't we? I mean, we're, we're, watch, we're, we're slaves to time. We're always checking. Actually, not all of us are slaves to time. Some people, they're just kind of so, so they're kind of casual friends with time. Okay, some people. I saw a lot of heads whipping around looking at people. Okay? But we are still subject to it because even if we ignore the moment, you, you can't really ignore the seasons, and eventually you've got to quit ignoring the years because certain things don't work the way that they used to. Right? So eternal judgment. I'm going to lay this before you today. If there is anyone in here today that does not know with a certitude that your judgment is unto rewards, there's a very simple way to know for sure. Scripture says that it is His grace that is meted up with the faith that He gives us that brings us to salvation. It's that simple. It's not a particular prayer that you pray. It's not a particular set of verses that you know. It's not a particular uh, doctrine or theology that you care to. It, it, it's a matter of allowing God to be who He is and you reflecting who you were made to be. You acknowledge that without Him, you're a sinner, that sin has consumed you, it's taken over your life. And you go, well, my life's not all that bad. Good. How much money do you plan on taking to hell? What good is it going to do you? Okay? His grace exceeds our sin. His grace goes beyond our sin. So I want to lay before you today, if you don't know with an absolute certainty, come and talk to me. Come and talk to one of the, the other leaders. You can talk to Steve or Matthew, Dennis. You can talk to Jeannie, Christy, or Angie. Um, talk to them and, and, and make sure you know. And then you got to live the faith. Okay? It's not enough to just believe that, oh yeah, this is the way things work. Even the demons believe that. Even the demons understand what's coming. And they shudder. Okay? So it's, it's allowing God to, to renew you, to rebirth you, to recreate you into the image of His Son. Amen? Amen. 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 All right. Father, we thank You. <clears throat> Father, I thank You that there is even the possibility of a judgment not unto hell. I thank You that in Your grace, You have made a way that we can come before You. We can receive repentance. We can receive the remission of sin. We can receive new life. I thank you that we can be righteous before you. I ask today, Father, if there are any here that do not know you, that do not know to a certainty where their eternity will be spent, that you would speak to their heart, that you would prompt them. Because your word says today is the day of salvation. None of us are guaranteed tomorrow. I just ask, Father, that your spirit would open their eyes to see and their ears to hear, that your, your spirit will work on their heart because you have said that you will take away our hearts of stone and you will give us a heart of flesh. You've said that you will write your commandments on it. You have promised us that your spirit will come and dwell with us as that seal of our salvation, marking us as yours for eternity and rebuilding us into that new creation, sanctifying us that our lives might reflect who you are. 
And I ask, Lord God, that you would continue to protect this church, this fellowship, this family. That, Father, we would be as shrewd as serpents and as innocent as doves, but we would be aware that the enemy seeks to sow wolves in sheep's clothing among the body of believers. Help us, Father, to always speak the truth in love. We pray these things, Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen.